Today I'm going to talk about deep learning. Deep learning has revolutionized pattern recognition and machine learning. It is about credit assignment in adaptive systems with long chains of potentially causal links between actions and consequences. Actions of a learning system and the consequences of that. Most of deep learning is about artificial neural networks. Such neural networks are inspired by the human brain, which has roughly 100 billion little processors called neurons. Each is connected to roughly 10,000 other neurons on average. Some of these neurons are input neurons um, that feed the rest with data, such as um, video through the cameras, audio through the uh, microphones, pain signals, hunger signals, and so on. And others, other processors are output neurons that control the finger muscles or the speech muscles. And most of the neurons are hidden in between where thinking takes place. And your brain apparently learns by changing the strengths of these connections. Um, each of the connections has a weight or a strength which says how much does this neuron over here influence that neuron over there. So these connection strengths determine how strongly the neurons influence each other. Similar for our artificial neural networks, which learn uh, better than previous methods to recognize speech or handwriting or video, or they learn to minimize pain for reinforcement learning agents that want to avoid pain or maximize pleasure or drive cars. And there are millions of applications of deep learning today. So the learning or the credit assignment is about finding weights that uh, make the neural network exhibit some desired behavior such as controlling a robot. Depending on the problem and on how the units are connected, such behavior may require long causal chains of computational stages where each stage is setting the stage for the next uh, processing step, where each stage transforms, often in a non-linear way, the aggregate uh, activation of the entire network. And deep learning in neural networks is about accurately assigning credit across many such computational stages. And that's the problem because you run into this credit assignment problem and the question is what of the many things that I did in the past have an influence on what um, is happening now such that I can change the things I did in the past such that next time when I come to a similar um, uh, case um, we, we can profit from the learned experience. In a sense, sequence processing recurrent uh, neural networks or RNNs are the ultimate neural networks because they are general computers. A recurrent neural network can emulate the circuits of a microchip. That's why it's a general computer. In fully connected RNNs, all units have connections to all non-input units. Unlike feed-forward neural networks, recurrent networks can implement while loops, recursion, etc. The program of a recurrent neural network is its weight matrix. Recurrent neural networks can learn programs that mix sequential and 
parallel information, sequential through time and parallel information um, processing in a natural and efficient way. Now to measure whether credit assignment in a given neural network application is of the deep or of the shallow type, we consider the length of the corresponding credit assignment paths, which are chains of uh, possibly causal connections between subsequent unit activations in the network. For example, from input units, through the hidden units, through the output, to, up to the output units in feedforward neural networks, um, where you don't have feedback connections, or um, from uh, the input units through transformations over time in recurrent neural networks and um, feedforward networks with a fixed topology have a problem independent maximal problem depth which is bounded by the number of layers of the of units. Recurrent neural networks on the other hand the deepest of all neural networks may learn to solve problems of potentially unlimited depth. Uh, for example, by, by learning to store in the activation-based short-term memory representations of um, certain important previous observations for arbitrary time intervals. Let me give you an example that shows that even static pattern recognition problems sometimes can greatly profit from recurrency, from recurrent networks. Normally, if you have an image which you want to classify, um, you take a feedforward network and you train it at the output to answer, yes, uh, that's a cow in this image, or no, there's no cow. And, um, and there is a theorem by Zybenko going back to um, a basic theorem of Kolmogorov, which uh, shows that um, a single layer, a single hidden layer in a neural network is enough to uh, compute any or to approximate any piecewise continuous mapping uh, with arbitrary degrees of precision. So in, um, in that sense, it is suggested that for neural networks you need just one hidden layer, which means the depth of a feedforward network isn't really important because you can do everything with one layer. Although the theorem by Kolmogorov does not um, explain how many units uh, you should have in this one um, uh, layer. In practice, however, it turns out if you have many, many layers, then many, many problems become much easier to solve. And if you have recurrent connections in your networks, then it turns out that many problems become solvable that are impossible to solve by um, uh, feedforward networks. But now, back to this example, let's look at parity, at the problem of 10-bit parity. What you have as an input pattern is a bit string of um, length 10. So it's like 1, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, and so on. And there are 2 to the 10 different patterns like that. There are 1,024 different patterns. And in fact, you can train a feedforward network to classify correctly all of these patterns. So the feedforward network has 10 input units and um, uh, a hidden layer, one hidden layer is enough, we know that, which also has maybe 10 hidden, um, hidden units. And then there is one single output unit which says yes, 1.0, in case the number of in bits, on bits is even, or uh, um, the opposite otherwise, if it's odd, if the number of on bits is odd. And you need to um, present a lot of training examples to learn this mapping. Now, the same mapping can be learned much more easily by a very tiny, small recurrent network that has only five connections, not hundreds of connections like the network that I just described. No, just five connections. There's one 
single input unit where bits are read one bit at a time, one, zero, one, one, and so on. There is one additional unit which has a bias input, which is always on, and then there is one single hidden unit which has a connection to itself, and there's one output unit from the hidden unit, um, with a connection from the hidden unit and from the bias unit. And now you've got five units and uh, five weights in the system, and you have to find a program that um, that makes this recurrent network solve the parity problem, which actually is very simple because all the network has to learn to implement a flip-flop. Whenever a new input bit comes in, if it's a one, then the internal state of the memory unit should be flipped. Uh, if it was one, then it should become zero, and otherwise, uh, if it was zero or close to zero, then it should become close to one. And this um, very simple program can be implemented by five connections and you can use the most stupid learning algorithm ever to train this network. You just randomly initialize all these connections with um, uh, weights selected between minus 10 and 10 and see what happens. Does it work on a very limited training set of three examples? Like for example, a bit string of size 7, another bit string of size 15, another one of size 21. If it works, then um, you can be almost sure that it's also going to work on all other bit strings um, of unlimited length. We performed that experiment many decades ago. So a tiny network, a tiny recurrent network can do everything that this much bigger feed forward network can do and more because the feed forward network is going, completely going to fail uh, as soon as the input strings, the input data, has more than 10 bits, 11 bits or something, because it was never trained on that. And it can't even process 11 bits. While this recurrent network, this very simple, elegant uh, network, has the, the natural solution to the parity problem, which works for arbitrary sequences. Just to illustrate the basic um, power of recurrent networks as opposed to feed-forward networks. So, um, back to our main topic of uh, deep learning. Um, in the next two lectures, we will first focus on deep feedforward neural networks, which are now widely used despite their limitations in all kinds of applications, uh, ranging from computer vision to uh, stock market prediction and whatever. And then, in the next um, part of the lecture, we are going to focus on the recurrent networks whose advantages I just explained and there it will turn out, yes, these recurrent networks are very powerful, but you have to do extra little things to make them work. Uh, the original recurrent networks, they didn't work so well, but there's something that is called long short-term memory and that works really well and that's now on your smartphone and it's doing the speech recognition and uh, many other AI applications for billions of people, billions of times a day.